So tell me, why are Catholics so nervous, so anxious, so uptight, so squeamish about the wrath of God, the judgment of God, and hell? It's false. No way. Not this time. No, not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's a made-up tale. It's a total fabrication. Let's talk about it. Hi, welcome to the Catholic Skeptic. My name is Hugh. Glad you could join me today. The last video I did got a, a lot of interesting reactions from the comments from Catholics. Usually Catholics, um, uh, a little pushback, you might say. Usually Catholics are more are more fired up in support. I mean, I always have some individuals here and there, and, and, and the Protestants are going after me. But uh, the last video, you know, seemed to have a, a reaction along those lines. I had uh, Catholics who were you know, very concerned and not in a way, nothing in hostile or anything. I have one, one person who, you know, thinks I was trashing the Pope, which I was not at all coming as the Holy Father in any way. The comment that I, I his comment that I was commenting on is a comment that I d discovered actually in these comments is often part of some Catholics' heart. They really have that sense that hell is empty or that, that we should be crying for that and praying for that and desiring that. And I just find this a fascinating, uh, fascinating topic. And it seems like there is just an anxiety, a squeamishness about the idea of the wrath of God, the judgment of God, which are all part of it. We, all of us as Catholics say, every, every one of us on, on a Sunday going to Mass, uh, uh, reciting the Nicene Creed, we all say he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And of his kingdom, there'll be no end. Christ will come again in judgment. This is a, a foundational basic principle. Jesus came to save us from our sins. There's a simple fact, a simple principle, very, very clear theological principle, not too deep, not too much that requires any reading between the lines. It's real simple. We are all sinners. All right. We all deserve, in the, so to speak, in terms of getting what we deserve, we deserve to go to hell. Jesus came to save us from our sins, Matthew one twenty one says. He came to save us from sin because that was what was holding us back. That was messing us up, is sin. You know, sin and wickedness. This is a, a common theme. And judgment is of God, and the judgment of God is central to the preaching of the gospel. Uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, St. Paul, speaking in, in the city of Athens, uh, does a very amazing sermon that's recorded in, in, in Acts 17 uh, at a place called Mars Hill, where there were Greek philosophers, Stoics, and Epicureans, and everyone who, who loved to gather together and talk about something or you know, something new that they've heard or seen or learned about. And Paul came there, and they brought him there, and they wanted him to understand what he was preaching about. And, and Paul described them as being very religious people, and then he says in, in verse 23, as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. There were all kinds of statues to various gods there, he says. And I found an altar with an, un with an inscription to the unknown God. So Paul takes advantage of this flat platform with nothing on it. And he says, whom you therefore ignorantly worship, him I'm declaring to you. He says, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he's Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is he worshipped by with men's hands, as though he needed anything. I mean, so God needs nothing. Seeing he has given to all life and breath and all things. And he's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. In other words, he planned where you're going to live, where you're going to be born. All peoples, he tells us. And he says that people should seek after God, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he's not far from every one of us. He quotes the poets, pagan poets concerning where his offspring. Uh, and then he says, and for as much as then as we are the offspring of God, in verse 29, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like an unto silver or gold uh, or, or stone graven art by man's device. And the times of this ignorance, he says, God winked at. In other words, God was patient with all of this, he says. But now, verse 30, commandeth, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He, he's going to command us to repent, the message to repent of sin. John the Baptist opened his, his uh, uh, ministry with talking about who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He talked about repentance. Christ opened his ministry, Gospel of Mark chapter 1. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The time is, is here. The, the time is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Believe the gospel. It's about repentance. He says, and he said, and Paul says here specifically, he commands all men everywhere to repent, verse 31, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. 
Right away, there's a call to judgment. There's a recurrent judgment. Judgment is what's going to come. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says, Is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. Yet I found that there seems to be such a, a, a lackadaisical kind of, or maybe that's not even the right word, because that would imply a t- an intentional kind of snubbing. It's not that at all. Uh, a fear, an anxiety, as I said, a nervousness about ever bringing this up. You know, rare do you hear of a Catholic priest now in average parishes ever bringing up the subject of hell. Uh, you know, I've read biographies of people who, who came to Christ uh, in, in, the, in the pre-Vatican II era where they would there'd be whole missionaries coming in, uh, Catholic missionaries that come and give sermons out just, you know, hell and avoiding hell. That was a serious point. Becoming a Christian, coming to Christ, becoming a Catholic, coming to the fullness of the sacraments of grace is to save our souls. Because Jesus came in to save the sinners. Remember Paul? Yeah, St. Paul even said it over in uh, 1 Timothy, uh, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief, he said. That recognition was very clear, very, 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 very pronounced in the Bible. It was something very serious, it's take, taken very seriously. It's, it's something uh, very adamant. In the Catechism, uh, paragraph seven, six, 678, Talking about judgment, he said, talking about the creed, he said, it says, following the steps of the prophets and John the Baptist, Jesus announced the judgment of the last day in his preaching. That Then will the conduct of each one and the secrets of hearts be brought to light. Then will a culp- the culpable and unbelief that, count- that counted the offer of God's grace as nothing be condemned. Our attitude about our neighbor will disclose acceptance or refusal of grace and divine love. On the last day, Jesus will say, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of these least of my brethren, you did it unto me. Christ is the Lord of eternal life. Full right, Christ has in order to pass definitive judgment on the works and the hearts of men belong to him as redeemer of the world. He acquired the right by his cross. The Father has given all judgment to the Son. These are all scripturally based, there's scripture references for each of these. Yet the Son did not come to judge, but to save and to give life as, as he has it in him. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge men, but to save men. This is his heart and desire. And salvation is what he's about. But obviously the implication of that is real clear. If, the, if he came for salvation, then there's certainly judgment. And there's no affront to the love of God or the heart of God's love to presume that there won't be any judgment. And, and as I've said to some of my, uh, my, my um, those who've written into me, some of the critics, the commentators, uh, uh, my Catholic brothers and sisters on this is, look, I appreciate you. But we should all have hearts for the lost. We should want to see, we see all people co- saved and come to the knowledge of truth. But does that mean that the grace of God is somehow retroactive? That it's somehow supposed to go uh, backwards in time and take up everybody out of hell that was already in there? You know, the message, everyone who's in hell chose to be in hell. When they chose to reject the grace of God according to the light that they've been given. This is a principal reality. And the fear of that, the, the fear to even bring that up seems, is somehow that's, that's somehow an affront to God's love or God's awesome grace. It's not at all. We need grace because we are sinners. We need mercy because we've sinned. Mercy always implies a need, all right? In the, in the book of Romans, chapter 1, it talks about comparing uh, the hearts of men. And it talks about those who chose not to, re- not to retain God in their knowledge in Romans 1, 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. This is talking about the world in general. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient. Being this describing now the condition of sinners, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. I always thought that's an amazing line. Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, in other words, we do have a realization that there is something we're going to face. Knowing the judgment of God, that they, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do, to do them. Therefore, he says, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art the judgest. Now, see, that's important. He says, for, for thou that judgest another, condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest another does the same things. Now, he's talking about human judgments. That's why we, don't ju- we aren't to judge each other or place final judgment. Uh, obviously, nothing that I said in the last video or this one implies that I or you or any of us have any right to speak to the final destination of any human being individually, whether they will make heaven or hell or whether they will come to grace in Christ or not. That, that's between, that is not our call. But then he talks about the judgment of God, he says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. 
And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do those things, and does the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God, now hear this, the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. God's goodness to us is precisely to lead us to repent of our sins. In other words, he's saying, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God's judgment is righteous, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness and indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to everyone that worketh good, the Jew first and also the Gentile, for there's no respect of persons with God. So the reality of judgment, this is something that's so clear in the word of God, in the written word, and the sacred tradition. It's clear in the catechism. Yet for some reason, this becomes such a, a hotbed of contention. You know, I've, I've, we've talked about private revelation uh, for, for, for my Catholic brothers and sisters, the, you know, the ones that are approved, those that have been approved by God, such as the, uh, the appearance of Mary at Fatima. And again, you don't have to believe that, but you are, but it is, it's been judged in the church that it's perfectly in line with what God has revealed to believe this private revelation. The Blessed Virgin Mary and the third secret of Fatima revealed by showing the, uh, the, the, the children um, a vision of hell, a brief vision of hell. And it was quite filled. It was filled to the brim with souls crying out. And the message was to desire that, that people would not go there. Not, not that we'd empty who was in there, but not that others would not go there. This is a principle that we deal with in this life. It's something that we want to be aware of. This is the point of it all, our salvation. You know, uh, you know and, uh, when it all said and done, for example, someone like myself who was a Protestant pastor became a Catholic, it's because I believe that the Catholic Church is the fullness of truth, that it is the church, church that Jesus Christ founded, and that outside of it is no salvation. All right, now that doesn't mean that no one everywhere, anywhere can't get saved if they're not a Catholic. What it does mean, though, is that that's where the grace is. That's where the location, the church, the body of Christ knows where the grace of God is. All right. Yes, uh, you know, there are those who will go to heaven outside of us, but, but that's not ours to judge who they are any more than to judge who would be going to hell. The grace is here, though, because the church is here, and the church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head of all things to the church, the fullness of his body that fills him and all in all. That's Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The principle has to be understood clearly if we're going to get this. You know, one thing we need to realize, you know, and I think sometimes Catholics don't realize this either, Vatican II changed nothing, right? The documents of Vatican II, there's no change in church doctrine whatsoever. There were change in forms and exterior things, and there is this thing called the spirit of Vatican II that sadly some very rebellious theologians and bishops and others tried to jump on the bandwagon of, of believing, oh, it's changed, oh, it's changing now. It's not changed. All right. Well, the mass is in Latin or in, in your own language. The mass still, we still believe in the mass that the body, the bread and wine become the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, holy and truly present are the appearance of bread and wine. We still believe the priest has the power to give absolution to sin. According to John chapter 20, verses 20 through 23, he does. The reality of, of, of these truths, they haven't changed. And, and, and so the reality of understanding them and understanding and walking in that truth ha shouldn't change for us. You know, there, of course, in First Thessalonians chapter 1, it speaks of Jesus coming to deliver us from the wrath to come. There is a wrath to come. It doesn't say we're, the wrath is gone now because of redemption and salvation. Um, in, um, for, I want you to see what it is. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, this is verses 9 and 10 of First Thessalonians chapter 1, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So the wrath of God is still coming. Salvation in Christ means being delivered from it. And so that's not something that we should treat lightly. It's a, it's a reality of it. In, concerning who Christ himself is, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it says, God, it says that the, the, Father, the God the Father speaks to Christ, God the Son, to Christ. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast, describing Christ now, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed with oil of gladness above thy fellows. Jesus loves righteousness and he hates iniquity. He hates lawlessness and sin and this whole notion of things. There's a hatred of sin in God's heart as much as there's a love for you and I who sinned. We need to recognize that. 
Sin kills, the wages of sin is death. You know, sin kills us. It's dangerous and deadly to us. That's why Jesus came to save us from it. And so the reality that, yes, that there are going to be those who are going to choose and not to receive that or walk in that is something you can't avoid or you can't run away from. It's just a reality of this truth in our lives. All right. The notion that uh, God is going to force everybody into the kingdom of heaven as if he's trying to, uh, at the, on, the, on the other side, to keep people out. That's not the motivation of God. But the descriptions that, that, that we're, we're given show us that, yes, there are those who will end up in hell. In the book of Revelation, chapter 20, I know Revelation is full of many symbolic terms. It doesn't change the fact that some principles of truth are, are really there. He talks about the condition. In fact, in, in actually in 19, he talks about the beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him and deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and that worshipped his image. This is Revelation 19, 20. Uh, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, of fire, of fire burning with rims, brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword which sat upon the horse, the sword that proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And I saw an angel from God coming down, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He said, laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be filled. And after that, he must be loosed a season. And I saw the thrones and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast nor, nor his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And then he says this, he says, Blessed and holy is he that take, hath part in the first resurrection, for on, the, for on such the second death will have no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with a thousand years. He describes this the, the situation. He talks about uh, surrounding the, the, the camp of the saints. It says in verse 10, a classic verse, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. As one uh, wise uh, writer uh, on, uh, on this channel did, did point out, he said, Hey, we know at least there's at least three people in there. The Satan and the, the beast of the false prophet who will be there and be tormented day and night forever and ever. Yeah. You know, and people have written about the well, the symbols of fire and yes, yeah, so maybe it's not literal fire, maybe it's something else, maybe the symbol represents something else, but the point is that the duration is clear. All right. This is a judgment of God. Something we have to be aware of. It's not taking away from his awesome love in Christ or, or what he did on the cross for us. In fact, that's why he went to the cross. Because we couldn't save ourselves. We weren't worthy. In spite of how many Protestant Catholics think it's all works and stuff. No, we can't save ourselves. We're saved by, the, by Jesus and what he did for us. This reality. We happen to believe as Catholics that he, of course, he transmitted that grace through the sacraments. And that grace is a fluid thing that continues as we walk with God. Not a one-time instantaneous uh, static thing that just happens and is done and is there. You know, the grace continuously flows. But yeah, it's received by faith. Absolutely. And God transmits that, transla transmits that grace rather through the sacraments. This is a, this is a reality uh, of what the church teaches, but it it means nothing if everybody's just in. I mean, it, it's something that God established and God ordained. He talks about uh, about the about the last days. He saw a side great white throne and him that sat upon it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This is New Testament. And I saw the dead, small and great, st stood before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And those dead were judged out of those things which were written in their books according to their works. And the sea gave up their dead that were in it, and death and hell delivered up them that were in it, and they were. They, and, and they were judged, every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You want to be written in the <laughs> book of life, correct? This should be the reality that matters to us. You know, he saves us. He's our savior. That's what savior means. There's salvation from, we're being saved from something. You know, we're commanded to repent of our sins for a reason. That condition matters. See, sometimes there, there seems to be a mentality. I've seen, I saw this in the Protestant world when I was a pastor, and I see it as a Catholic too. There, there's this sort of mindset that everybody's a victim. You know, sometimes the love of God is preached kind of in a, more of a, a psychobabble way, kind of a modern kind of, I'm okay or anything. Oh, poor victims. You just need to come to Jesus. He loves you so much. And Amen, he does love us so much. But we're to repent when we come to him because we are held responsible and accountable for what we've done. He can forgive and cleanse that, amen. That's the good news. 
But the reality that we've done something wrong, yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> you know, another part of Romans, it, it, it talks about how the, how the, every mouth is stopped, Romans chapter three, and every and the and whole world becomes guilty before God. You put me on a guilt trip, God, and put us all on a guilt trip because we were guilty. All right. There would be no point in mercy if I did it. With the very act of mercy, if you ask me, like for example, Pope Francis emphasizes mercy. The very notion of mercy implies automatically you need some help. I think I mentioned on the previous video, or at least I mentioned it in, com in some of the comments. If I didn't, um, when a person is found guilty of a crime or something like that, a court trial, many times it'll say they throw themselves on the mercy of the court. Well, what does that mean? They want mercy. They want the sentence reduced. They want some mercy given to them in place they already know they're guilty. Well, you know, Jesus is our advocate to the Father. Amen. Thank God that he he paid the price for our sins and shed his blood. And, and we tr we look to him and we trust in him. But the reality is, yeah, we are guilty. and We need mercy. We need grace. That's why he gives us grace. That's why we're told in Hebrews uh, uh, 4, 6, 16 to come boldly to the throne of grace so we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the reality of the grace of God. So to think that the love of God means we're not denying there's any wrath of God or any judgment. I mean, we look at the wickedness of this world. We look at the wickedness of the situation we're growing up in, the kind of world that our kids are growing up in today, the, the kind of madness that's all around us, sin and selfishness and, 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 and hurtfulness and cruelty and, and all of the thing from the from horrendous wars and terrorist attacks and crimes and to bitterness of heart and unforgiveness and broken homes and broken marriages and broken families and abuse and scandal and torment all of these things are sins these are sins that need to be repented of and yes we are told in the vision of the sacred heart jesus told saint margaret mary algoa behold this heart which has so loved men he loves us absolutely. For the Word of God says it clear in, 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 in the famous John three sixteen verse. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes on Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, He loves us. But it's not a denial of our sin. In fact, it's more toward that reality. In John chapter 8, when the woman was caught in the act of adultery and dragged before the court. Now, she was set up, obviously. There's a crowd of guys who want to stone her to death. They say to Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And, of course, the first question should pop in everybody's mind is, well, where's the man then? If she was caught in adultery, then there was someone she sinned with. He committed adultery with someone. The law of Moses, actually, when you actually turn and read it, specifically says that the, 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 the man and the woman be brought together to the gate and stoned. If they were really following the law. So it was more of a setup. But, you know, G Jesus turned to the crowd. He just wrote on the ground as if he heard them not. No one knows what he wrote. Some people think he wrote, where's the man? Or some think he was just writing out the law. But he just nonchalantly waited while this crowd was asking him, what do you say? Are we, we law says she was just stoned. What, what are we doing? And he says, he simply looked up and said, he that is without sin among you. Let him cast the first stone at her. And he went back to writing on the ground. And slowly... Being from the oldest to the youngest, they were convicted of their own conscience. They began to drop the rocks and walk away. And he was left alone, standing with the woman. And he st says he stood up, stood up and he looked at her. And he said, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? And the woman had an interesting response. She responded back, no man, Lord. In other words, what about you? I don't know if she knew Jesus was God or not. I don't know, but she, she knew he represented God anyway. What do you condemn? And he says, neither do I condemn thee. But he didn't stop there. He said, Go and sin no more. It's important. He didn't deny there was a sin. Even though she was probably set up and, and all kinds of things happening, she still willfully committed a sin. And he said, deny there was a sin. So he said, Get going. go and sin no more. In other words, repent of that sin. The reality is sin is a reality. Punishment for sin is reality. Judgment for sin is reality. These are, are, the, reality, are the realities of life, the realities of our existence. And so did not, we can't deny this. And, and we're living in a time of exception. It says in the, in talking about the last days in the, in the catechism, uh, paragraph 675. He says, before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies this her pilgrimage on earth. And will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of, Antichrist, of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and, and for his Messiah come in the flesh. Obviously, Catholics, we're not tree-tribbers. <laughs> the re-revelation happened another issue, but no. 
The whole point is a trial of those who are in the church. The Antichrist deception already begins to take shape in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that the messianic hope, which can only be realized beyond history through the eschological judgment, in other words, the church has rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of millenarianism especially the intrinsically perverse political form of secular messiahism. The church will enter in unto glory, the Catechism says, of the kingdom only through this final Passover, when she will follow her Lord his death and resurrection. The kingdom will be fulfilled then, not by historic triumph of the church through a progressive ascendancy, but only by God's victory over the final unleashing of evil, which will cause his bride to come down from heaven. God's triumph over the revolt of evil will take the form of the last judgment after the final cosmic upheaval of this passing world. All right, This is the reality of it. Now, maybe at that point, we'll all come to the Lord. Sure, that's a good possibility. Does all Israel being saved described in the book of Romans mean literally all of, of the Jews coming to the Lord? Perhaps. Perhaps it refers to the, 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 Jews, the Jews and Gentiles together since the Bible, since Galatians 3.29 tells us, if you be Christ or Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, verse 28 before that says, there is in Christ neither Jew nor, 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 nor Gentile, male or female, slave or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. You know, in Ephesians 2, he talks about breaking the wall of middle partition between us. That we both be reconciled you know, to, in Christ, to reign in one body by the cross. But the point is, there's no point there where it says God's going to force people to come to him. The willful choice to submit yourself to the lordship of Christ, to trust him. See, if you're trusting in Christ and not yourself, then you're also submitting to the will of God. Those go together. Those go together. They don't, they're not separate events. To trust him is to believe him and is to obey him and to recognize he's Lord. To not live under ourself anymore. That's the heart of sin. To live under him instead. That's a supernatural act. That's a work of grace in the soul. Amen. But we want to understand that it's, be, it's to be delivered from a wrath that's there. And that there are people who've already come, have appointed a man once to die, and after this they've already passed into judgment, and say, their fate in that sense already sealed. Yeah, the Catholics believe in purgatory. Now we've shared with them. You can watch my video on purgatory. Purgatory is not an in-between place. It's a place of preparation to be ready to enter into heaven. If you're in purgatory, you're already saved. It's just a matter of when you're going in. All right? And that is a very biblical principle, and I've given scripture clearly in it in the video I did, so I suggest you watch it right away and then dismiss that. as no, that's ridiculous. No, it isn't. I used to think it was ridiculous too when I was evangelical. I thought I was wrong. Lots of things in the Bible you might not know are there. But the reality is, it is that the God's awesome love, that God is love, does not mean that he does not have wrath. Romans chapter 11 tells us to behold both the goodness and the severity of our God. God is good, but he's also severe. There is judgment. There is wrath. There is redemption. There is deliverance from the wrath to come. These are all part and parcel of the whole plan of God. It's in the Bible very clearly. It's in the sacred tradition of the church. And saints and visionaries have, have, brought, have brought this back, back by hearing from heaven. Yet for some reason in our, mo our modern and postmodern era, from the 20th century on into the, now the 21st century, there's this mindset that somehow, oh, if I'm really walking with the Lord, then, then, then yes, his love is so wonderful. Hell will be empty. And, and every wicked person, everyone, it doesn't matter if they're you know, a liar or a cheat or a rapist or a murderer or a molester or a torturer or a genocidal maniac, well, they're going to get their redeemed. They're going to come to the Lord. Could that happen? Is it possible? All things are possible with God? Sure. But everything that God has revealed as dogmatic truth in the last two thousand years would say no, that that's not going to be the case. The opportunity was there, but the choice still had to be made. The opportunity to be forgiven of sin, the opportunity to be truly repentant, the opportunity to receive that grace is there. But there's many people who slap away the hand of mercy. They slap away and they reject that love. Because the thing is, to receive God's love, to receive God's love in Christ— if you believe that Christ they died for their sins on the cross, then you believe the cross was necessary, that Jesus did need to pay the price for sin, that this was God's will in the first place. And that walking with him is surrendering to him. Christ himself and going to the cross in the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He himself surrendered, the person of the Son surrendering to the person of the Father. Surrendering to the will of the Father. And all of us need to surrender to the will of the Father. 
this, you know, Jesus told Pete, Pete, Peter in, uh, in the end of the Gospel of John, he says, when you were young, you went where you want, did what you want to do. When you're old, someone's going to stretch forth your hands and take you where you'd rather not go. And it says this signified the death he would die. And we know historically Simon Peter was crucified under the emperor Nero in Rome, upside down because he thought not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Lord, but he died in crucifixion. And Jesus prophesied it in the Gospel of John, and history testifies to it. But the reality of all of it involves the fact that, yes, there's suffering in this life. Yes, there is judgment and wrath to come. Yes, Jesus came to save us from our sins. And that truth should not be determined by, you know, whimsical spiritual speculation, by just accepting the dogmas of the church. You know, yes, should we be praying for fervently for souls? Amen. Should we desire that all men be saved and come to know the truth? People quote that one a lot to me. He, God says he desires all men to be saved and come to know the truth. Yeah, I know. And the same God also told us, straight is the gate, narrow is the way to life, and few there be that find it. But b- b- wide was the way and broad was the path that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in there at. All right? So the reality of that. Jesus talked about the fact that he had sheep and goats on one side of him and the other. Individuals that he rejected. He says the ones who, the ones who were who were faithful, the ones who who who, 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 who fed him and clothed him and did, did, by doing to least of his brethren, go prepare the kingdom, prepare for you for the foundation of the world. Then he also spoke of those who, who didn't. And there was a place prepared for the devil and his angels, not prepared for man, but prepared for the devil's angels, that those or the, who, who were rejected would go. Go into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil's angels. He spoke of the place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I take Christ seriously. If we take to take all of his words seriously, and there's just a, a mindset to, to reduce sin, to not talk about sin, we talk about problems. We talk about it as sickness. We talk about it as, as beyond my help. The idea of being responsible and accepting the fact and owning it and saying, yeah, I'm a sinner. And I throw myself on God's mercy is central to what it means to be a Christian, to be a Catholic, to believe the gospel. And so I encourage you not to be squeamish and afraid of these truths, but embrace them. Embrace them. They're as much a part of the love of God as anything else. Anyway, that's enough for now. Please hit like and subscribe. Please continue to send your comments in, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever you like. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.